turned out that that was a good thing. And I think one of the reasons that that was, uh, worked so well for Danny was Danny was a dad. You know, I think he had three girls at the time. And um, so I think it was a different kind of tone. Not that there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, chases and a lot of playing and a lot of uh, different venues. Like we we play one huge festival that uh, the whole band put fake beards, uh, beards on. So we would look like ZZ Top, and <laughs> because the, the, like like in the first movie, the police were after us. So uh, it, I, I recommend that people get get it, you know, and 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 visualize it. It's very very funny. Uh, Blues Brothers 2000. I think it's great. It just didn't. It wasn't. I, I don't think you know. A lot depends. I kind of found this out, you know, as an actor in movies. Uh, unless the studio is willing to, you know, commit a great deal of money to the promotion of it, it's not going to do particularly well, particularly mm-hmm. well. So that's that's why I don't think it was a huge smash. I, I, the music was great, the performers were great, and uh, James Brown was in it and a lot of fun, and he he's, he was an interesting guy to talk to him, he'd say, Murphy, Murphy, let's go on the road. We gotta go on the road, Murphy. Ow! We gotta go on the road, Murphy. But, but, but I, I feel would, good. <laughs> like I knew he would. Yeah. yeah. He, he was He he was quite uh, one of my life heroes, you know. And, and of course, don't forget the good old boy. What the good old boys or something, you know, playing and then you pretend to be and then people throw beer and uh, glasses and everything. And I'm sure you got yeah. showered with a really good reception. <laughs> that that in the in the first film that that was a wild time. John Landis, uh, the director, loved uh, the excitement of, you know, if, if he had a movie that would throw pies at people, he'd be doing that. The, the situation was we were uh, the good old country blues brothers boys, and 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 it worked well. I mean, I thought, but John Landis, the director, loved throwing those so-called glass bottles. Now, the truth of the matter is, the glass bottles—they're prop bottles, and they're made of sugar, and you could bite into them and and chew them. And uh, John Landis said, "It's sugar, guys. Come on, don't be afraid. But you, <laughs> Ain't going to hurt you. <laughs> you're not going to hurt you. Well, of course, he's not there. He's behind us, the other side of the screen. So they were pouring and pouring and pouring. It it was a it was a, a crazy time because you you naturally, no matter what it is, somebody throws it to you, you duck. And uh, that's what we did. We 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 would duck." That that uh, it was fun. It was, and also at the time, as as you noticed in the uh, in the film, the uh, it was very smoky. It was very smoky, and that was you know such a long period of time ago. Uh, I can't even remember. The uh, they used uh, a smoke, a lot of smoke, uh, on the set, and at that time the smoke was oil based, mm-hmm. and it. It would get into your skin and was very uncomfortable. And if it got into your eyes, it was it was terrible. It, it, everything has changed now. They're they're you know they have all new smoke machines. They're made with dry ice, and uh, that's not a problem. And you know we used them in the band, and we used them in in two thousand. That was a lot more fun. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, as a guy, I'd say this ain't no Hank Williams. <laughs> Right. That's still one of my favorites. So, <laughs> all yeah, right, we'll get we'll, we'll get to some of your uh, films as well too. You're listening to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow dot com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com dot com for all your needs. If you're looking for a professional website without breaking your budget, Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. That's one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. 
or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. Also, check our Facebook page for interviews, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. We encourage you to like, share, and invite friends to our page. You can also download and listen on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, and take us wherever you go. We're here with Murphy Dunn from the Blues Brothers, or as some people call him Murph, but we'll call him Murphy here. So we talked about the Blues Brothers, and we all talked a little bit about his dad being the late George Dunn, a prominent politician out of Chicago, being part of the Cook County um, Board Commissioners and everything else. And you also appeared in some other movies as well, too, like in High Anxiety, also The Mothman Proces- Prophecies, Cowboy Bebop, and uh, quite a few mo- others. And maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about and how you got involved in those. Well, uh, it starts, starts off, I, I did a whole bunch of Laverne and Shirley's and uh, a whole bunch of other television series shows. And Mothman Prophecies was a straight audition. You know, I auditioned for Paramount, they called up, and the, you, you go in there and then you audition and then you go home and then they call you back. And then you go home, and they call you back. <laughs> you go through this on on a regular basis. And I had a scene with Richard Gere in that movie, and he he was very nice, and it was fun shooting. And almost everybody, I I, I gotta say, I really Barbara. Str- I did main event with Barbara Streisand and uh, uh, High Anxiety with Mel Brooks, who was who was very funny. And I did Oh God with Carl Reiner, and uh, I've just done a, a ton of stuff. And I wanted to mention briefly uh, a story about Ray Charles in in the movie. I'm gonna take a sip of water. You you can talk and faster than I can, and and you just go like crazy. How did you get into radio? <laughs> well, that'll be for another time as well, too. I got okay. started in 1982, which um, probably makes you about, um, I'm going to have to say, hmm, maybe maybe somewhere around uh, just after Blues Brothers, 18 years old. Uh-huh. That's how I got in 1982. I've been in business for over 30 years. And, um, I mean, if you listen to me back in 1982, it's like Mickey Mouse scratching on a chalkboard. I mean, that combination Ooh. was not pretty. <laughs> and were you in your hometown, or did you do it uh, through a, a college or a high school radio show? How how was that? What was that like? I I, I actually did in Chicago as well too. At um in uh, Palatine at Harper College. So it was a WHCM, oh, sure. and yes. So I'm sure you're familiar with that. Started in 1982. Worked there three years in every aspect. Went to Southern Illinois University. Everybody says. Party school, but that wasn't the case. It was uh, the the oh, top yeah. top uh, state school in broadcasting, ranked number three in the whole nation behind Texas A and M and Oklahoma. And then I worked at other stations, been in Milwaukee for a little bit, and then came out to Bismarck, North Dakota in 2007. I'm talking to you right now here in the studios in uh, beautiful North Dakota. Maybe a little bit chilly, but um, sometimes you wish you're in California, but sometimes you wish you'd cool off in North Dakota, so you just have all that. So, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 of course, you know, you just had to talk about the great Ray Charles as well, too, and, um, you know, right. let's just f- if, finish if up your story. If you recall, uh, thank, thank you for the, the background. As, as you recall, uh, Ray's Music Exchange was the name of the, of the place, and um, I went in with John Belushi, and this is how the scene went. Uh, you know, we go in there and say we need new equipment. The stuff you sold us has a bad, has a bad action. It really and uh, and then we go into the song. But before the song, uh, the, uh, a, a young black man, boy, child, like I would say, thirteen, comes in and attempts to steal a guitar. Mm. And that's when Ray Charles pulls out a forty-five automatic and shoots. You know, at at the boy, he doesn't hit anything. But in the, and then he says, "It's a shame what's happening to the youth of the day." And uh, the uh, what happened was, I'm standing right in front of Ray, and I'm right next to John Belushi. And I would say, because the counter's in the way, you know, about two 
two feet away. And we're in the middle of our dialogue, and all of a sudden, Ray pulls out the gun at the wrong time. Bang, 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 bang. Oops. And I push, yeah, push John out of the way, and, and I fall down. And John Landis, the director, says, cut, 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 cut. Uh, take the weapon away from Mr. Charles, please. <laughs> and, and Ray said, say, did I, did, I, did I miss my cue? He said, yes, you did, Ray. Uh, <laughs> we're just going to take five. Oh, my goodness. You must have had a heck of a shot, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you know, it, it, it had a huge load in it and made a lot of noise. And it scared the hell out of both John and myself. Maybe trying to tell but, someone to hit the road jack. So, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, he was doing uh, "Shake a Tail Feather." He he went out and did that. And it was a that's a wonderful dance scene. I love that scene with all the kids dancing out in the street. Oh, oh, that's just one of my favorites as well, too. And um, also some of the chase scenes they had going through the old. Um, Mall, what was it in Juliet or Orland Park, where it was um, closed but reopened just for those crash scenes? And there was a couple of uh, crash scenes over over in uh, Northwest Side of Chicago. And ironically, a couple of my sisters lived around there at the time. And uh, my wife happened to um, move, move into Park Ridge, her first job in Chicago, moving from West Virginia. She was above um, that one street where they had one of the crashes. So Blues Brothers definitely had. Um, a big, big part of uh, Chicago as well, too. And, of course, you know, too bad they didn't make a video game, but that was one of the most iconic movies, you know, of 1980 and, um, you know, well-remembered as well, too. We're glad you're keeping it alive. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm blessed. I just have to say that. Yeah, it, watching those, what would happen is they would have, I don't know how many they started out with, 30 or 40 police cars, and what they would do is, you know, second unit that's when they don't necessarily have the the lead actors in it what they would do is they would shoot the dialogue with one cameraman one sound man some one place and then they would shoot in another location all the stunt drivers and uh then at night they had a very large facility to put the cars back together oh my gosh so, so what they would do is, you know, the cars would crash, uh, and I actually saw. I and when I wasn't working, I'd go, say, you know, where, ask where, where they were, and the teamsters would send a driver to me, almost like I'm a star or something, and and I would go and see, you know, the crash scenes, and one of them was really spectacular, where a a, a cop car comes over, a, like comes below Wacker Drive, up, and another cop car is coming from the another direction and uh, he hits the guy from down low hits just the top of the gumball machine you know on top of the cop car that that was amazing that uh, that was an amazing stunt driving situation but it was it was very it, it was a, it's an iconic film because nobody ever did that before and of course, John Landis was the first as well too. You later got into um, voiceover acting as well too. You were in um, Cowboy Bebop back in two thousand one, and you also were in I, Standalone I, Complex. If I'm right, that was a cartoon. Also, you're actually in a video game involving Star Trek called Klingon Academy. You can just uh, tell us a little bit about those, and especially being in a video game. Well, I, I have uh, I have the lucky ability to be able to you know, do a lot of dialects. I can do a French dialect. It'll look like this. I can do a, a German if you need to be German. So I do a lot of different kinds of voices. So when uh, they're auditioning for these parts, because you can make some money doing them, and uh, I, I, you get to be known. It's a very small circle of people who do all all of the voiceovers in, in, in this business, and there's a great deal of money that can be made, so everybody wants to get into it. Not the least of which is, you know, when you go on an audition for an acting job, you have to memorize your lines. In a voiceover, you you just need the script, the script in front of you, to uh, uh, you know read, read the lines, and then the director in the booth will say, 
accent this line and then accent that line and we'll do it again. Uh, but there's another kind of, of voiceover that I'll tell you about 